I'd like to say a brief word about the Nuffield Foundation before introducing Professor Brian Bell, who will be chairing the event today. The Nuffield Foundation's mission is to advance social well-being. We do this by funding research and analysis in the areas of education, welfare and justice to help better understand the issues affecting people's life chances and the trends and disruptive forces that are changing the structure and context of people's lives. It is our aim that the research we fund informs social policy and ultimately makes a difference to people's lives by demonstrating how we might address inequalities, discrimination and vulnerabilities in an increasingly diverse and fragmented society. We know that undocumented migrants and asylum seekers are at particularly high risk of vulnerability and that this has been exacerbated by the hostile environment in the UK <coughs> where individuals unable to prove their legal right to remain face significant barriers to accessing healthcare, welfare benefits, employment and housing. Estimates have suggested that the population of undocumented migrants and asylum seekers in the UK is increasing, but little is known about these groups as they do not feature in official statistics. And that's why we are delighted to have, been, to have funded the project being presented here today on vulnerability, migration and well-being, and also the pilot work that preceded it. This research increases our understanding of the circumstances that these vulnerable groups face and the factors associated with their well-being, and it makes recommendations for policy and practice in response. I would like to issue a huge thanks to Laurence Lessard Phillips, Jenny Fillimore, Antje Lindenmeyer, Lin Fu and Lucy Jones, who have undertaken the work and rose to the challenges and opportunities created in the context of this research project by the COVID-19 pandemic. And thank you also to Doctors of the World UK, who opened up the opportunity to explore the data collected through their work. When we started this work back in 2017, we knew there would be some important insights, but the recent news of conditions faced by migrants and asylum seekers highlights the continued importance of this work and the insights and understanding that it brings. Thank you also to all of the panellists who will shine further light on the relevance of this work and the policy and practice responses that are required. And now, without further ado, let me introduce Professor Brian Baum, who's kindly agreed to chair today's proceedings. Brian is Professor of Economics at King's Business School and Chair of the Migration Advisory Committee, which provides advice to the Home Secretary on immigration policy in the UK. He's a leading labour economist who's widely published and his work on immigration has included papers examining the progress of immigrants in the labour market in the UK and the impact of immigration on crime in the UK. And he's also worked extensively outside academia, including at the Bank of England and the International Monetary Fund. Welcome, Brian, and welcome to you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Um, I realise I sound dreadful at that. I work for the International Monetary Fund and advise the government on immigration policy. <laughs> So, sorry about that. Um, okay, um, well, um, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I think I want to start just by thinking about why this research is so valuable at this point in time. I think you can ha hardly open the papers uh, without reading a new story about a migrant, some group of migrants who are having difficulties in one way or another. So, um, on the Migration Advisory Committee, we're particularly interested at the moment on um, issues about exploitation, particularly in the labour market that migrants face relative to um, resident workers. So, um, you know, issues about uh, debt bondage, um, about unsafe and unsatisfactory accommodation that's provided by their employers, often being tied to particular employers. And I think part of our interest is really just that, you know, we're sort of cognizant that we make policy advice and often we think, particularly as economists, we think very kind of, oh, it's very cut and dry about what the right economic response is to something. We often forget about the people uh, who we're talking about and about the, the way that they can be exploited uh, within the system. And so I think it's kind of it's something, something certainly high on our agenda. And I think it's particularly interesting to look, as this research does, at groups that are particularly vulnerable within the system. So in some sense, you know, perhaps rightly or probably rightly, but hopefully, hopefully rightly, we probably think less about worries about, you know, entrepreneurs coming to the UK on very skilled visas, we tend to think, well, they can probably look after themselves, they have power 
in in uh, in society they have good language skills they have um ability to move away if they have problems and it's actually really interesting to look at groups where that's clearly not the case and where they have particularly high vulnerabilities and so this research seems to me is particularly relevant at, at the moment and as alex said particularly in the context of the, the dreadful stories that we've been uh, reading about in the last few weeks about uh, particular detention centers in the uk and the problems that um, asylum seekers are facing um, and i think in addition the research given that the research looks explicitly at undocumented migrants that's that's particularly interesting given how difficult unsurprisingly it is to do research on undocumented migrants and but how important they clearly are within our society and thinking about how we can um, adjust policy where sensible to, to help um, is a really important part of this research. Um, so um, my job is to introduce the researchers and then let them get on and tell you what they've actually found. So um, there are three three researchers um, on uh, here, two in person, I think, and one on, online. So we've um, Dr. Laurence Lazard Phillips is Associate Professor um, at the Institute for Research into Super Diversity at the University of Birmingham. And her main interest is uh, in the perception, measurement, and dimensionality of <coughs> immigrant adaptation, ethnic inequalities in education and the labour market, and transnational behaviour across immigrant generations, and social inequalities and social mobility. That's a, a very large list of things that you're interested in. Yeah. I'm impressed that you can manage to do all those things. And you're currently leading two ESRC research projects, which again sounds I like... I was, I oh, was. Sorry, you, you stop doing that. I have stopped doing that. I was going to say, that sounds like too much work. Yes. Um, but, um, and so... Um, the second researcher who's online is uh, Jenny Fillimore, who is Professor of Migration and Superdiversity and was the founding director of the Institute at Birmingham. And her research focuses on welfare and civil society actions in conditions of supervised diversity. And most recently has worked on um, issues around uh, Europe's uh, neighbourhoods. Um, and then we've got Ancha Lindenmeyer, who I think is Ancha, uh, who is a lecturer in qualitative methods and medical sociology at the Institute of Clinical Sciences at Birmingham. And her research interests include the ways in which people live transnational lives, addressing their health problems and engaging with health professionals and services, and the lived experience of chronic illness. Um, I'm going to uh, leave it there. I'm gonna, if you want to talk about the Institute for Research into Superdiversity, I'll, I'll leave you to, to talk about that and sort of what the Institute does. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Laurence, who's going to um, present the research. I've used the wrong button for sharing. I've been told a few times as well. Okay. Yeah, lovely. So this, um, uh, my bio has uh, reminded me that I probably need to update this on my university profile. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's a, a one mental note to make. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. I am Laurence Lessard Phillips, and I am the PI of on the, this Neffiel Foundation uh, funded project on vulnerability, migration, and well being. And what I'll do is that I'll try to go uh, as quickly as I can, uh, hopefully, not by speaking too quickly, um, through uh, some of our projects. And my colleagues, Anche and Jenny, will also uh, talk about the work. Uh, as Alex was um, uh, saying earlier, this is a project that, that we started initially with a pilot project in 2017. Um, so it's a, quite a, a little while uh, in, in, in the making. Um, and this is the, the combination of, uh, of a great collaboration uh, with my colleagues at, at Birmingham. Okay. Um, oh. Okay, so in a nutshell, uh, the project, and that's something that we have uh, that we're just, that we have uh, highlighted in in the report as well in the summary that's available uh, outside. Um, is so, the, so the, the the project, the aim is to explore the well-being profile of groups at risk of vulnerability and the factors associated with well-being, uh, with a fo uh, spe uh, specifically a focus on undocumented migrants and asylum seekers. And by vulnerability, what do we mean uh, within the bounds of the project? Um, is that we look at um, at significant risk, uh, individuals who are significant risk of harm while substantially lacking the ability or means to protect themselves. So that's what we understand by vulnerability uh, in uh, individuals and groups at risk of vulnerability. And by well-being, what we're doing is that we're taking a multi-dimensional approach to, to well-being, uh, 
thinking about uh, Sumner and Mallet's uh, dimensions that they mentioned, including material well-being, such as looking at income, relational well-being, so relationships that people have, as well as subjective well-being, such as um, self-reported health. Okay, so we're, we're, we're using the, the umbrella term of well-being. Um, and the project, and you can read a, a great narrative of what happened with the project, what our aim, you know, the original aims were and, and what we ended up doing um, in the report. But we started by being funded for an original project, the original project, which was, which was to look at data between 2011 and 2018 from Doctors of the World UK. Um, and then we started, the project was due to start in May 2020. I'll leave it at that, it's a long story, uh, but actually what we did is that despite the challenges that the pandemic um, threw at us to a certain extent, but not, not literally, but you know, figuratively, uh, we managed to really um, come up with a, a great project with two other sub-projects that were also funded in part by uh, the University of Birmingham, looking at well-being during the pandemic and also a well-being and institutional and contingency accommodation. So what we refer to as ICA uh, or um, hotels and barracks, um, for those of you not familiar uh, with that terminology. Um, so we ended up with um, a great program of work. And the main objectives uh, of the project uh, were to uh, profile, the, profile the well-being of individuals at risk of vulnerability, identify factors that are associated with well-being, understand the way in which you can monitor well-being, especially for uh, populations at risk of vulnerability, uh, describe health and access to care for asylum seekers uh, living in, in uh, temporary accommodation uh, um, and inform policy and practice about uh, actions that might influence um, vulnerability uh, and well-being. Um, so the team, so we have a team mostly based at the University of Birmingham, but also a collaboration uh, with people, uh, with colleagues at Doctors of the World UK. Um, and we also have some advisory board members who advised us on the um, direction of the research throughout the years, and I wish to uh, thank them uh, for their uh, insightful um, contributions um, and very engaged contributions as well. Um, I also want to thank colleagues and doctors of the world uh, UK as well, and our, our colleague Lynn here, who was the um, postdoc um, on, on the project, who did a lot of work uh, with the data. Okay, so that was a kind of a, a very brief uh, overview of the project and the objectives and our, our methodological approach. So what we, uh, the, the approach that we took for this project was to uh, use a mixed methods approach um, with different types of data. So what we had were, was a primary qualitative data and secondary qualitative and quantitative data. So we have different uh, types of data. Um, so what we ended up doing is diff uh, different types of mixed methods approach and trying to uh, get um, into trying to uh, fulfill our, the objectives of, of the research. Uh, we've also used a co-production approach where we've engaged with relevant stakeholders in trying to orient um, the research that uh, we would do, including our colleagues at Doctors of the World, but also in discussions with um, other, um, other colleagues, relevant stakeholders. Um, so in terms of the, the, the data, the secondary data that I'm discussing um, is both quantitative and qualitative. So the quantitative uh, data is based, is based on a questionnaire of service users from Doctors of the World uh, UK, um, because Doctors of the World UK, they run, they run clinics that provide uh, medical care information and practical support for individuals unable to access the NHS uh, and, and NHS services in general. And these include, but are not exclusively, uh, these include asylum seekers and undocumented migrants and uh, other migrants, but also uh, other uh, individuals. So anyone unable to access um, NHS services. And they've kindly uh, provided us with the data, their data, the data about their clinics for us to analyze and look at um, well-being. So what we have is we have kind of three data sets. We have the data set of combining the, year, the data from years 2011 to 2018, and also two data sets from 2020 of um, the people using the clinics uh, during the early months of the pandemic between March and September 2020 as well as data from people and um, ICA um, and from about September 2020 until January 2021, more or less. Um, so we, we, we have that. So we have quite a large number uh, of cases in our main, in our main data set, but smaller, uh, smaller numbers um, in, in the two uh, sub-projects. 
What we also have is um, from the qualitative secondary data, we have access as each of the consultations from which we get the questionnaire data. Uh, we also, also have notes about that cons consultation and we were uh, granted access to look at those notes and analyze those notes, um, which means that we have some a sample of 363 notes uh, from 2015 to 2018. Uh, for, for us to analyze, as well as uh, smaller numbers of notes uh, to analyze from, from 2020. And also, when I'm referring to primary data, what I mean is uh, our, my colleague Anche here uh, did some uh, interviews with uh, Doctors of the World UK volunteers to try to get a, a bit further into um, some of the findings <coughs> from the uh, quantitative uh, part of the study. So in terms of analysis for the quantitative uh, data that we had, we uh, use a mixture of descriptive statistics and regression analyses. If you want to hear a bit more about this, you can uh, look at like at this in the report, or you can ask me questions uh, afterwards. Um, and then for the uh, qualitative uh, data, primary and secondary, there's been a mixture of content and thematic analysis that's been uh, put together. And as mentioned, we had some stakeholder engagement in our co-production co approach, and uh, the project was approved by the ethics committee of both uh, the university and doctors of the world. Okay, so what I'll do is that I'll uh, briefly uh, go through uh, some of the findings uh, from the main data set that we uh, constructed from 2011 to 2018. Um, so the data that we had comprised a relatively equal share of female and male uh, service users living in London, which makes sense because uh, most of the clinics from Doctors of the World UK are actually located in London. Um, during the pandemic, they also moved to uh, service uh, telephone cons consultations. Um, before, did you also have telephone consultations before? Yeah. yeah, they also had telephone consultations before, but moved exclusively to telephone consultations uh, during the, um, the pandemic and the lockdown uh, period, um, which means that they kind of broaden uh, the geographical um, scope of the, the people engaging with the clinics, but uh, with the kind of physical clinics, uh, most of the, uh, the, the, what we call the service users or the people using uh, the service uh, were living in London. Uh, mostly aged, be uh, mostly between the ages of 25 and 44. Um, quite often in the UK for a relatively long time, but also about a third of the people in our sample recently arrived at the time of consultation, so within uh, within a few months. In terms of the, the immigration status of the service users, uh, close to two thirds of service users in the data that we have are classified as undocumented. Um, 39.13.9 percent as asylum seekers and 28 21.8 percent as other and by other uh, migrants so what we're what we mean here is usually uh, EU nationals uh, people on uh, visa holders on work or study visas um, or, or people who've been granted refugee status as well and people who have not been necessarily been able to be identified their, their, their uh, legal status being identified um, so these are part of that 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 other group but we exclude a uh, UK nationals and again it's based on individuals who had been unable to access NHS services and um, and needed the need uh, and, and needed the um, needed to go and consult with doctors of the world for uh, quite often um, medical uh, medical reasons um, and in terms of uh, service users engaging with the different clinics some of the main reasons and a large, very large proportion of the reasons why people uh, come, go to the clinic is for GP registration, so help with GP registration. And I think Andrew will say a bit more about the uh, sometimes a process through which uh, people can go uh, in order to be registered with a GP. Um, so that's one, one of the main reasons and also another reason needing help with NHS cost because what we have within, um, within that sample and unsurprisingly, is a, a very large proportion of individuals uh, in, in who are destitute, so who uh, live below the, pro the poverty threshold. Um, and, and as part of the questionnaire, some of the element of questionnaires are also there's also some uh, issues about the kind of barriers to healthcare that have been um, to healthcare access that have been mentioned. And some of the most often mentioned include a lack of knowledge of the system or, or the rights that individuals have to actually access uh, healthcare. Um, some administrative and documentation barriers, especially with uh, registering with the GP, and also language barriers that are quite important. So these are kind of uh, important um, barriers to uh, to access uh, accessing healthcare. Um, in terms of uh, looking at findings on um, 
well-being. So what that's part that's from the the quantitative uh, the quantitative quantitative data. Um, so what we, we, we found in terms of subjective well-being and looking at descriptive statistics is that close to 40% of service users reported as having good or very good health and around 25% as bad or very bad health. And that's and we, what you can see is that you have relatively similar patterns for a physical, psychological and a general health. So if you're thinking about well-being as comprising three different indicators, so the, 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 the proportions are more or less the same. And that, if you compare to the, the levels of um, well-being within the general population, the, the, there's a big difference in terms of the proportion of individuals within the, the general population reporting um, bad or very bad levels of uh, general health. And it, it, these tend to be um, much lower. So we're talking about a, a, a sample with uh, individuals who um, have a lower level, uh, low levels of well-being. In terms of social relational well-being, which is uh, looking at whether or not people have uh, support, um, um, we found that over over 60 percent uh, of, of service users can rely on someone from for emotional support very frequently or frequently. But you also have about 10 percent of individuals who reported ha never having uh, sources of support uh, where where they are, um, which is um, I find that quite quite high quite high as a percentage. Um, so one in ten uh, basically. In terms of economic well-being, and as I said earlier, we had a very large proportion of the people in the sample uh, living with insufficient income uh, for, for, for daily life uh, to cater to their needs. Um, so what, what we've also done in terms of, um, of uh, quantitative analysis has been to also look at the factors that influence well-being in a set of regression analyses. So what we'll look is look at different factors that influence uh, well-being. So um, actually, uh, positive, good or uh, very good health, so positive, positive well-being. Um, and what we found is that uh, in immigration status um, is 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 quite is quite an important uh, factor uh, in, in in that compared to people in, in the other migrant group, individuals who are either undocumented or asylum seekers. Uh, there's that, there tends to be a negative relationship. Uh, between uh, being part of that group and having higher levels of well-being. So uh, these uh, individuals attend in, in those groups tend to have lower levels of well-being. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's about being an asylum seeker or an undocumented migrant necessarily in and of itself, but potentially about other factors that are linked to that group membership, okay, to try to avoiding essentializing uh, um, uh, these groups uh, in our results. Um, so the, across, across the board, there is a negative relationship, uh, and asylum seekers tend the, the relationship tends to be uh, the, the association tends to be more negative for asylum seekers uh, compared to undocumented migrants. Um, interestingly enough, and very topical as well, what we found is that um, people living in more secure types of accommodation uh, tend to have higher levels of well-being. Uh, this is not necessarily a surprise in and of itself but also quite telling in terms of the kind of discussions that are happening at the moment, especially with regarding uh, the housing of uh, asylum seekers. Um, there, there are some negative relationships between um, age and uh, levels of well-being, um, and also for uh, male service users, uh, more a negative association for general, with general physical health, as well as relational uh, well-being and material well-being. And in terms of a length of time spent in the UK, uh, people who have spent more time in the UK, there tends to be a negative relationship with our psychological well-being. And that's why we can think about the fact that we're, we're talking about uh, individuals who uh, consult with doctors of the world who have been in a long time in the UK and have not been able to access NHS services. So they may be uh, a group at, at very particular, uh, with very particular needs and, and, and very particular, um, and particular conditions. Um, in terms of relational well-being, unsurprisingly, if you're thinking, if we're thinking about it, is that the longer you are, you have spent time in the UK, uh, has actually the, the, the more positive uh, the relationship uh, with a, a high levels of relational well-being you have, uh, which also makes sense. The longer you are in a place, the potentially the uh, longer you've had an opportunity to make links with people uh, within the UK and uh, be less isolated. So uh, what we found is that we had some. Um, associations between various factors uh, and well-being. And these are relatively similar across um, immigration uh, statuses. But as I said, 
the uh, asylum seekers tend to have a, there's a more a, a more negative association with different types of well-being, and asylum seekers also tend to have um, lower um, lower rates of uh, psychological well-being compared to um, the, the other two groups. Okay, that's all for me. Okay, hello, and uh, I'm going to be giving you a bit of an overview of the qualitative findings. Sorry, the print on the laptop is uh, very small, so you can probably see me peering at it, so apologies for that. So, just kind of looking at the case notes that case workers wrote and uh, analyzing the pretext in there, um, we found that of the group of 263 service users I had where there were case notes that I, I could study, uh, over half came to Doctors of the World with a physical or mental health concern, so that's kind of quite a lot of people. And the others were there um, because they wanted GP registration without having an immediate uh, burning problem or wanted help with other things like NHS charges, for example. And um, about half of the physical problems were actually some causing pain. And I think that's obviously, as we kind of look at it, probably not surprising that it really kind of gets people to actually seek help if they have something that's painful. But on the other hand, it's probably also kind of to think about, um, well, how long have they actually lived with this pain before they actually went and sought help? And uh, not everybody, but some of these people have been kind of living with the uh, something like that for, for quite a while. And um, some people also discussed mental health concerns. There were a small group of people with really, um, you know, ongoing mental health problems where they potentially had a diagnosis before but had them dropped out of services and needed to reconnect. Um, but others just had things like low mood or nightmares or worries about various life situations like worrying about home office decisions, worrying about being able to stay, uh, worrying about making enough money in order to, uh, you know, keep um, in their accommodation. Um, so looking at the material situation, and that's, I think, first I should say that the case notes usually start with the vignette of the service user's immediate situation. So that is kind of helpful to get a picture of who these people are, how they live, who they live with, and that kind of thing. And it also comes out of the um, caseworker trying to find out, are they safe where they are? Um, is there something in the accommodation uh, that, uh, that is unsafe or that means that we have to um, refer the person on uh, to another organization or really kind of try and uh, help safeguard them? So we have quite a bit of information there about the material situation, such as housing and then also employment. So um, we have information about earnings for quite a few of the service users. And again, very unsurprisingly, most are from things like cleaning, building work, childcare, restaurant work. And with quite a lot of people, um, they were only part time or only occasionally. So they were quite low levels of, of, of work and earning for some people. And uh, that, that <coughs> also means is that a lot of people relied on informal networks. So um, in our sample, 69 said that they relied on family or friends for a place to stay or for food and sometimes for money. And there was sometimes a bit of a blurry kind of um, relationship between, um, you know, friendship and support, but on the other hand, also informal work if uh, people paid their friends for things like cleaning or childcare. So that's kind of quite an interesting situation um, that maybe uh, we need to know more about um, with additional research. So most service users lived with family or friends in what they said was a fairly stable and safe environment. And um, I think from the quantitative data, because there's a tick box which says, is the, is the housing stable or is it temporary? So that's um, how those people come out on the more stable end. But then you also have kind of um, data about 
things that even though it's um, stable at the moment and safe at the moment, but it is kind of temporary in a way that they don't know um, maybe the friend that they're living with um, won't be able to um, put them up kind of much longer, say, if their uh, wife was having a baby or something like that. Um, or some, or would they be able to earn enough money in future in order to, uh, you know, be able to stay in this accommodation? So there is, I think, quite a grey area, at least from the quality side of it, between the uh, kind of stable and unstable. And but then there were people for whom housing was quite clearly problematic. I mean, the people who were kind of sofa surfing, there were just a handful who were absolutely street homeless. But there were also things like. Um, you know, not feeling really welcomed or feeling that they've outstayed their welcome with their friends or having arguments with roommates. There, were, there, there was uh, a person who uh, shared his room with several people who were all smokers and that person wasn't and that, that, that wasn't a good situation. And a few had, and I think as uh, you just said at the beginning, the kind of tied housing to their job. Uh, domestic workers or employees living about the shop. And most of the people who were in the Doctors of the World sample were kind of okay at the moment. If they lived with employers, the employers were good or the employers were at least, you know, okay. But lots of people had earlier experiences from having had to run away from their earlier employer because they were violent to them or they were not kind of paying them what they should. And uh, so, we have quite a few people who had kind of these bad experiences as well. So uh, social support, and uh, I think that's also there's a lot about it in Laurence's data already. And in our sample, the qualitative sample, case workers sometimes noted that service users were well supported by friends and family. So also kind of living with friends and living with family, if that works well, that's also a source of social support. And also, I think something that I should mention in this context is that about a quarter of service users were helped to get to Doctors of the World Clinic by a friend. So, and I think that's also kind of a really important part of social support. And sometimes they'd stay with them or translate for them or kind of help them get registered um, with the GP. So there was quite a lot of you know practical support by people to get the service users to the um, health services that they needed. Okay, and so just to give a kind of a bit of a, a general kind of, um, you know, pulling together the qualitative findings. So I thought that if we're thinking about material well-being, um, relational well-being, and um, things like, uh, you know, self-reported health and, um, you know, the subjective kind of end of well-being, there are strong links between that. And you can also see those in the qualitative data. So uh, material well-being did really rely very much on support for others, for many people, which again, it's great when it works well, but it can then also kind of lead to um, difficulties and in a few cases, even kind of um, breaks uh, with family or family or friends. Housing was a really crucial point where lots of things came together. So the economic well-being, as in how much um, can you afford, uh, you know, how much space for yourself, and uh, the social relational well-being in who do live people with and are the people that they, you're living with actually um, sources of support or are they becoming problematic? So that's kind of a strong link there as well. And also the importance of navigators to access health services that I just talked about, kind of getting people to the clinic or um, helping people with things like online registration with GP practices. So also talking a bit about the um, qualitative interviews with the Doctors of the World volunteers. So they give, gave us further insight into the material situation of those most at risk of vulnerability. So they all had you know, descriptions of what, in their understanding, a um, service user at risk of vulnerability um, looked like. And um, they also discussed the process of trust building between the service user and the caseworker, which was important if we're thinking about people asking kind of quite detailed and quite personal questions. And how do you build trust in order to make this um, an experience that's kind of not bewildering for the service user? 
and um, decision making on when and how to ask potentially difficult questions. So people would uh, again kind of try to build the trust first and kind of start with the you know more easy to answer questions. And also um, they talked about quite a bit the interaction between caseworkers, service users, and others in the context of the clinic, and that thought was quite important as well. That um, you know, when the clinic was before COVID, when it was in person, that people could be there, they could see the people who were kind of helping them, they could get a cup of tea, they could potentially talk to other um, service users while they were waiting, and they would kind of see what was going on, and that was a really important, you know, part of it. So. Pandemic overview, or should I? Yeah. Okay, so um, the next findings about well-being during the pandemic, that's um, the sample of uh, case users that, uh, of, of uh, service users that we looked at um, to represent time, uh, times during the pandemic. And during the early months, um, 70, uh, 47% reported uh, good and very good health, and 26.3% reported a bad or very bad health. So there wasn't really a clear pattern of worsening subjective well-being compared to previous years that we would probably have accepted, but we should perhaps also think, is this a particular kind of sample of people because it's now kind of by phone rather than in person, and it's kind of the... Um, pandemic has uh, really kind of, um, you know, had a lot of impact on people's lives. So that might be a slightly different group of people from the one that uh, came to the clinic before. But um, well-being was still lower compared to general population figures. And again, as in uh, data that Laurence discussed before, the situation of asylum seekers seemed to get more negative than of the other groups of migrants. So talking a bit about the qualitative end of it, so our analysis of consultation notes and interviews with the volunteers added, you know, additional detail and additional depth and context to the situation. And um, so one thing really to take away is that access to primary health care all of a sudden became a lot more difficult. Some practices said they would not take any more patients because of COVID, so they had closed their list, they didn't want anybody else. And also registration moved online, so it was actually uh, impossible to just turn up at a clinic, kind of take away a form, fill in the form, take the form back as you would usually, or, or potentially ask the receptionists for help. It would be kind of an online registration, which would mean that they would have to have access to, um, you know, Wi-Fi or, you know, data for, from their phones or um, laptops or whatever. So they would have to have kind of access to uh, the digital world. And also, if we have language barriers and kind of more general kind of about understanding uh, of NHS systems and how it works, actually, this started making it a lot more difficult. So service users' material situation also worsened. Work opportunities dried up. So if somebody's working, you know, occasionally um, in a restaurant, then obviously the restaurant is closed. And or if somebody is kind of working in care, then, um, you know, care uh, places were a lot more careful about uh, who was kind of accessing their premises. So it's kind of uh, work opportunities really did dry up. And um, also from um, Doctors of the World volunteers doing all this kind of um, taking people through the questionnaire on the phone, um, made it a lot more difficult because you didn't have the personal report, you didn't see the other person, you didn't, obviously they would ask, is there anybody else with you in the room, but they didn't really have control about the environment that the uh, service user was in, so that made it a lot more challenging on the phone. That's back to you. Yeah. Now I believe that our colleague Jenny should be able to talk. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good, thank you. Um, sorry, I can't be with you today. Um, I'm going to talk through the findings to the um, additional sort of mini project that we did around initial and contingency accommodation. Uh, this project came about because we were approached by Doctors of the World, 
who had been working in a handful of hotels and one barracks in the south of England um, during the pandemic. Uh, and at this period of time, the numbers in hotel accommodation, which you know has always been used or, or for, for very many years, but generally was seen as a short term measure where people stayed for no longer than 30 days, the numbers increased from the low thousand uh, um, to 37,000. Um, and this approach, um, the kind of um, more institutionalised form of uh, housing as opposed to dispersal of asylum seekers, which has been putting them in individual houses or shared houses in communities around the UK, it's become you know, much, much more common and um, under the, 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 the Borders Bill, is expected to increase. So the findings of this study have great importance um, for the way that asylum seekers are housed as we look forward. Now, the data we have was collected between um, July and January 2022, um, and uh, sorry, 20 and 2022. Uh, there were 313 usable consultations in hotel and barracks, and we did a quantitative analysis of all of those consultations and then we took a random sample um, of a, a third of the consultations and did a systematic thematic analysis of the notes taken by the Doctors of the World um, medical volunteers. So that was a GP volunteer. So in the same way that Anche has just described, uh, the vast majority were asylum seekers, <coughs> and 75% um, were male. Uh, important to note, you know, a quarter are female, and this is mixed gender housing that we're talking about, um, which comes with considerable risks. Uh, there were also unaccompanied um, asylum seeking children in there and children accompanied by one or more parents, uh, pregnant women and newborn babies. 56% um, of the sample were under the age of 30. Uh, now, through the, uh, the quantitative data analysis, we identified that a staggering 32% needed help with mental health. Um, there was a wide range of um, urgent, chronic and complex medical needs that were recorded. And as you can see from um, our little uh, um, figure here, uh, the numbers of um, people in the accommodation um, that were experiencing poor health versus the general population was, uh, was much higher. Um, we also found through the um, quantitative data that there was, uh, you know, the, the largest reason that people wanted assistance was help with GP registration, um, which is often the reason that doctors of the world engage with this population, but also accessing prescriptions. Um, and when I'll say a bit more about that when I get to the qualitative data and accessing the HC2 certificate that they need in order to access healthcare and um, free prescriptions. 52% or 52.5% of the population had no accessible information about COVID-19. And this is at a time uh, in the midst of uh, the pandemic, uh, at times when uh, social distancing rules were in place um, and there were lockdowns. So um, you know, it was kind of important that they had that information. Now, in terms of the, the case notes, um, so I, um, with Doctors of the World, volunteer Bethany uh, uh, analysed the case notes. And what we, um, you know, key theme in these case notes is highly relevant uh, to the way that accommodation is moving um, at, at the current time, was the impact of this accommodation on health conditions, both uh, mental and physical. Um, and I just want to highlight that, you know, the call recently, and, you know, it's just happened that Manston has been closed because the conditions were so appalling and the call was well we need to put people in hotels but this is not the perfect solution so what we identified was that um, there were a, a wide range of problems um, uh, particularly around food inflexible eating hours um, very uh, poor quality food lots of ground <coughs> food junk food that people weren't used to um, so lots of reports of um, stomach pain, children just not eating because they couldn't stomach the food, and uh, individuals who, for example, needed a uh, liquid diet because of a medical condition, you know, it, it would take days, if not weeks, to get home office approval to have that diet, during which time they were unable to eat and lost, you know, sort of 10, 20 kilos of weight. So 
quite a serious situation here. Uh, people had very low uh, sense of security. Obviously, um, this is quite a kind of densely populated environment and they're surrounded by many strangers. Uh, the conditions were poor, uh, quite um, um, unclean, um, not much opportunity to do any exercise, no distractions, and there was a very low level of help and support uh, provided. Uh, so often people were moved from hotel to hotel or they were moved from one form of uh, another form of housing into the hotel and what happened in these situations is that any treatments they were having for chronic or severe conditions any medications they were receiving um they, they, there was a break in those so some of these um, treatments were life-saving treatments and some of the medications um, the same uh, and there was this whole process of trying to set it up again uh, within the hotel there were not any staff who were capable or maybe willing, it's hard to say because we were looking at the notes, uh, of aiding residents um, to uh, regain access to their treatments and so on. Uh, and the, the lack of distraction, the levels of boredom, the levels of isolation um, were really closely uh, connected to deteriorations of, of, in, in mental health. Um, so we talked in the previous slide about, you know, third of the population reporting mental health um, concerns. Uh, there were high levels of individuals who were self-harming, um, suicide attempts, and people who were highly distressed, individuals who uh, needed antipsychotic medication and were not on that medication. So you can imagine how distressing that was for them, but also for the other residents and very possibly for the staff living there. Um, often, doctors of the world were dealing with very complex cases, so in 55 people in the case notes, so this is more than half, um, had two to five reasons why they needed the assistance of doctors of the world. And on the whole, um, health professionals, whether they were health visitors, midwives, GPs, whatever, were really reluctant to come into the hotel at all, and the hotel staff were um, reluctant to support individuals to access healthcare, even A&E, even um, calling ambulances. Uh, and there was a real digital divide in access to services and sometimes, you know, very poor access to data or to mobile phone signal so that scheduled phone appointments just couldn't be um, made. And Doctors of the World um, undertook an enormous amount of actions to deal with access. Um, and this is going much more beyond, you know, above and beyond their sort of usual approach in that they were coordinating multiple services. They were sort of the linchpin uh, for what was going on there. So they were dealing with wide ranging administrative procedures. Um, so obviously sorting out the HC2s, connecting with doctors, connecting with oncologists and all sorts, um, advocating on the behalf of service providers and doing loads of sense making and coordination. So it wasn't enough to enable someone to have free access to prescriptions, but of course that individual didn't know or, or, or perhaps lacked the language to be able to connect with the doctor's surgery in the way the doctor's surgery wanted and to know how to order, for example, a repeat prescription. So doctors of the world were teaching people how to do that and coordinating at the same time. So making lots and lots of referrals to other um, services to try to increase the support and particularly for those with severe mental health conditions. So connecting up with NGOs to try and get an additional support, but even trying to get kids into school. Um, so it was a really wide, wide range of activities. And more than um, one action was needed in 62 cases. So again, nearly more than half. So I mean, our conclusion at the end of all this is that there was a need for humane, safe and sanitary accommodation with full access to healthcare. Not sure anyone would disagree with that. We made extensive recommendations from this report and it continues um, to have great relevance at the, at the current time, as do our recommendations. So I'd urge you to look at this if this is a sector that you work in at all. Firstly, the importance of GP registration for all. GPs are gate holders. Without access to a GP, you can't get your meds, you can't access uh, the wider secondary care services that are needed. So we're arguing that registration should be automatic. We should be asking people to try and find a way um, to register themselves. Um, providing information about access in 
you know, very clear <laughs> about the call phase in multiple languages, making sure that if we're going to put people in this kind of accommodation, there's a high level of digital inclusion, not exclusion. Ensuring that everybody knows about rights of access to healthcare because of so much confusion by healthcare providers, supporting with costs where needed, <laughs> and fundamentally, although a bit blue skiesy at the current moment, is you know only using this kind of accommodation as a last resort. This should not be the way that we house asylum seekers in the UK, and particularly where there are children and extremely vulnerable individuals with mental health conditions involved. I won't go into the vast range of recommendations we made, but we did make a lot of specific recommendations um, for different organisations and indeed for the Code of Inquiry. Right, um, now this is, um, we, we are at the end of our presentation, you'll be probably pleased to hear. Um, and of course you would expect the main report also contains a wide range of, of recommendations and suggestions for next steps. I think what we've done in this project, and particularly the way that we've been able to take the data uh, and use it in particular situations, early stage of the pandemic, around the contingency accommodation, is just to show how important it is to collect data on migrants at risk of vulnerability. You know, to be able to demonstrate the kinds of people that do and don't have access to healthcare, and particularly focusing on conditions as well, uh, because it is of huge concern that individuals with life-threatening conditions or people who've got terminal conditions are not able to access healthcare. Um, we're also able to use the, um, the data to show which kind of populations are excluded from healthcare, um, you know, and particularly highlighting the, the situation of undocumented migrants and asylum seekers who are really as, you know, in part of a system that should have that access. Um, we think this data um, is of great use to a wide range of um, organisations um, and to researchers. So we've just sort of scratched, um, you know, the kind of just touched the tip of the iceberg, really, with what we've done in the analysis. Uh, and there's been a lot of work in there, cleaning data and, you know, preparing it for future analyses. So it may be useful to talk to Lawrence about the way we might collaborate in the future. But what we'd really like to see, of course, is this kind of data collected more routinely and on a wider scale. Um, you know, it's very fortunate that doctors of the world are collecting such data. There are drawbacks, of course, because the data that they are collecting only relates to their clients. And their clients are those who are excluded from healthcare, but probably those who are better able to connect with an organisation like an NGO than some. So it's kind of not quite the middle audience or the middle group of clients, but it's certainly not the whole spectrum of asylum seekers and undocumented migrants. A further concern here, of course, is that um, we are in a situation where if you collect data about undocumented migrants, you may end up um, in a situation where people are too fearful to, to provide that data because they're worried about their immigration status, or even that there is a risk that that data is used to identify and detain individuals. Um, so it needs to be really thoughtful, really careful, but um, just to summarise, it would be great, or just to finalise, it would be great to see um, more collection and analysis of data around the health outcomes and access of asylum seekers and undocumented migrants. And um, it's been fantastic that Nuffield have invested in, uh, in this and enabled us to show what is possible, but clearly uh, a greater level of investment is needed. And one would hope that organisations like, um, you know, the NHS might step in here. OK, and thank you for listening. Enormously for that very clear presentation from Laurence, Ancha, and Jenny. Um, we're now going to move on to uh, the first bit of the discussion of uh, this uh, great research, and uh, we're going to hear from three uh, different people who can give kind of their comment on the uh, on the findings, their thoughts about the findings, um, and perhaps some insights from their own personal, professional working experience. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the three people to begin with, and then we'll go through them in order and ask them to come up and give it. Um, 
few minutes of discussion. Uh, so we're going to start with Ella Johnson, who is the Associate Director of Research for Doctors of the World UK. And she's worked at uh, the, uh, this organisation for over four years in a variety of roles. And interestingly, she's just finished a two-year secondment with the Greater London Authority, um, working on uh, with regional NHS leads on how to improve primary care registration for these patients without documents and in coordinating methods of removing barriers to access to the health system for those in the asylum process and other newly arrived uh, communities. Um, then we then got uh, Basma Elduki, who is a doctoral researcher and assistant lecturer in migration studies at the University of Kent. Uh, and he, her research is very broadly about refugees and their voice, power and representation. Um, she's recently written some work on uh, both Palestinian women and youths in uh, camps in Lebanon. Um, and as a refugee herself, is using uh, her lived experience to think about um, practice and professional expertise in her writing. And then thirdly, we've got Angelina Jalonen, who is Head of Therapeutic Services at the Refugee Council. Um, she's a qualified psychological therapist and therapeutic supervisor and has a Master's in Refugee Care from the University of Essex and has worked for over 20 years in the humanitarian sector, uh, with working um, particularly in London and across the region with asylum seekers and refugees. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, our first uh, discussant, Ella, to um, come in. Um, hi everyone, um, my name is Ella Johnson, I am the Associate Director of Research at Doctors of the World. Um, I am a maternity cover for Lucy Jones, who um, was part of the inception conversations for this project. Um, and um, but I've been at Doctors of the World for almost five years now in a variety of roles, including outreach and policy advocacy. So what I thought I would do today um, is talk specifically about the recommendations that uh, Jenny mentioned, so the ones that we made to specific bodies, and just give a flavour of work that's been done to that end per recommendation, and maybe opportunities to keep the work moving or where it's stalled or where the synergy to, to, to keep pressing on that. Um, so thanks for having me, and also thank you to the team for sticking with this project as it has evolved, not once but twice, um, from its original conception, so that's great. Um, you know, uh, yeah, Doctors of the World, we've got a clinic in East London as well as mobile outreach services um, we're staffed by volunteer GPs, nurses and support workers um, and there's an advocacy um, policy service that runs alongside that um, to ensure that the issues being raised in the clinic are communi communicated to policy makers um, to improve health policy and practice. So the first, I'm going to read it, um, I'm going to read the recommendation. So the first body specific recommendation was to NHS England. Um, and this was about introducing an accountability mechanism to ensure that practices refusing registration um, are held to account for that um, or to have some leadership and something top down from NHS England to keep to monitor registration refusal, to look into reasons and drivers behind that and to address those with practices. Um, so broadly, there is a lack of this within the system. That's not for um, that's not to say that we're not circling the issue and there's bits of relevant work going on, but there is a gap for that. Um, for example, at the Doctor's World Clinic, um, patients with the support of a caseworker, if they're allocated to practice, if, they're, if they attempt registration but are refused a set number of times, you can contact, contact NHS England, they will then allocate a practice. Um, but clearly that's not a sustainable model that involves the patient themselves ringing NHS England or an advocate and that's not sustainable. Um, of course, you could report the practice to CQC, but again, this is all pay, uh, uh, patient or advocate level, it's not um, top down. Um, Dr. Sewell is at the moment working on a research project called Right to Care in partnership with University College London, which looks at tools to improve conversations at the reception desk. So what do receptionists need needs to encourage their adherence to NHS England guidance around registration? And what do patients need in their pockets so that they'll have a more successful conversation at the reception desk to assert their rights? So again, all this work going along, going 
on around sort of modern GP registration, but nothing. Um, and it just led that being said, and um, NHS Digital have um, done a piece of work to combat registration refusal recently, um, which is which is really really interesting piece of work and and really promising. Um, it's to support digital registration, and it will remove um, it will it it will enable patients to register without documents um, and because it won't allow you to upload them. And then if there is a registration query, Primary Care Support England can communicate directly with the patient themselves rather than the practice having to be the, um, the middle ground there, which is which we've heard from receptionists will greatly improve and support their work. Um, so it's not that um, NHS England are not doing any work in the space. Uh, the GP Access team are looking at health inequality very seriously around registration. Um, but as far as an accountability mechanism that monitors registration refusal, I don't think we're there yet. But I, I thought some of that background might be helpful. Um, so to the Home Office, there are, there are, this is largely around mandating accommodation providers to support, um, to directly assist patients to register with a GP. Um, I included just a, a screenshot there of the statement of requirements. This is the contract which um, the accommodation provider holds with the Home Office and it lists their obligations and duties in, the sp in that space. Um, within that uh, statement of requirements, there is no um, contractual requirement for the provider to assist G with GP registration. There's something around liaising with the local health agencies to make patients aware, residents aware of where the health screening is, for instance, but they will not be supported to register. Um, there will be some proactive interaction with health services if a patient presents with serious clinical need, but these are very serious in the contract, such as lack of consciousness and heavy blood loss and so on. You know, that is not um, that is not meeting the kind of needs, um, the widespread needs that we've just heard about in the in the research. And um, so during the pandemic, you know, we've heard and it's really important to say that institutional accommodation is not new and um, we it's a lot more. Um, it's in the news a lot more, but it was used before the pandemic. Before the pandemic, the average stay was thank you, the average stay was um, much longer than the recommended 27 days. And um, it's just that we've seen it ramp up on a, on a huge scale. And with that, because particularly in the acute phase of the pandemic, GP registration rate. I'm speaking for London here. There was some, I think, improvement because you know residents were just undeniably staying for so long that accommodation providers started to move into that space and assist registration. That being said, that's not monitored. Um, I'm with no doubt in my mind, particularly with what's in the news at the moment, we are rolling back on that. And again, there's nothing um, to hold anyone accountable. So the Home Affairs Select Committee themselves recommended assisted GP registration. They also recommended a variation to that contract um, in order to mandate it. Um, they put a time limit on it. If a resident's like, likely to be there for three weeks, um, we, would, we would say there should be a time limit <laughs> because most people exceed the three weeks. In a lot of cases um so yes i know that there are regional bodies looking at the contract and looking at where there is space to make uh, changes there but um yeah we're not there yet but uh, hopeful um cqc so this is about the, the, the care quality commission the body that um that um assesses the um safety and effectiveness of gp surgeries um to move into the asylum accommodation space and to start looking at actually is this accommodation suitable by CQC standards in terms of is there viable means to health services um, attached to that accommodation? Um, so yeah, that is a, I think that's a really, really solid recommendation. I think there's a lot that could be done there. I think that there's some, you know, if we were to look at that piece of work to add that variation to the asylum accommodation contract and introduce this as a CQC measure, you could really see the accommodation provider and health agencies working together. So um, we're in conversation with CQC on that at Dr. Sewell, but um, nothing as of yet. I've watched this space, hopefully. Um, I'm sorry if I'm speaking quickly. I'm just aware I've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, this, these recommendations are largely around the NHS charging regulations um, so and the suspension of them because they, are, they have such a role to play in healthcare exclusion. And they also often we've seen influence that conversation at the registration desk about entitlement to services. We've got this restricted access at secondary care, primary care free to all. Sometimes there's a bit of a disconnect there, so it's deeply unhelpful for both primary and secondary care, and obviously for people who are affected. So um, we've seen that the Mayor of London on Windrush Day this year called for a suspension of NHS charging regulations. 
the Royal Colleges of Obst and Gynae, Child and Paediatrics and Midwifery have all called for a full scrapping. So there's something there about harnessing the power of medical unions. Um, to the second one, um, the NHS Race and Health Observatory, so the watchdog looking at the impact of health inequalities in a racial context. There's space, I think, to strategically engage with them with this report in terms of have you considered the role of the hostile environment and it's and the role it plays here. They did release a review in February this year, but disappointingly there wasn't very much in it on NHS charging. A little bit about data sharing and how that disincentivizes uptake of care, but there's a lot more work to be done there. Um, the Institute of Public Policy Research released a report looking at alternatives to the NHS charging regulations. So um, what what you know in a, in a world where we don't believe that there will be success in calling for them to be scrapped, of course that's that's certainly Dr. The World's position. And um, what could an alternative be? Uh, and the BMA, the British Medical Association, endorsed the IPPR report in terms of how people prove residency. So if we're talking, if we've got an entitlement-based system, should it, does it need to be a legal document that says I'm resident, can it be my child goes to this school or I'm registered at this GP? Um, it was about broadening proof um, of residency. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, and in terms of the, with the, the one about the future public health crisis and thinking about preparedness and anticipating the needs of this community, um, what we learned during the pandemic is all of the work that NHS England had to do in the context of the vaccine rollout to undo the harms of the hostile environment in healthcare. So you've got a system which for a long time has been telling people that the NHS isn't for everyone, it's only for some people. And then you've got public health crisis, which necessarily requires the participation of everybody. There are people that they don't associate the NHS as a place of safety, they look at it with fear. So that's why you saw all the comms and messaging with the, cam with the vaccine campaign, which was no one's going to check your immigration status, for, uh, it's free for everybody, there'll be no data sharing. Um, and I'm, I'm confident that that message won't have received everybody and I'm confident that there, are, there will be people that weren't vaccinated for those grounds. So look at how the system had to adapt because of the structural harm of those regulations, um, you know, and then think about that in terms of preparedness. Um, I've got one, two, no, I haven't, I've got two more. Um, so this, this one um, is around system-wide healthcare reform at the point of access. So I'll just talk to the bottom one quick because I don't have much time. Um, but this is also the thing about the pandemic and the learning that we had around GPs we heard earlier being a gateway to the NHS. Um, what does that mean for your access to routine health services? So immunisations, screening, um, if you're not registered with a GP. And the way that we had to adapt for um, the COVID vaccination programme um, and did, you know, mobilised a, a, in a massive way. Um, in London, they're looking now with the COVID legacy and equity partnership at building on that to ensure that lessons within vaccination um, are applied to routine health services. Um, so I just thought I'd mention that. It's by no means the answer, it's very London specific, I appreciate that, but you can see work in that space that could be built on um, nationally to make government uh, recommendations to government. And finally, yeah, this is my last one, um, for the COVID inquiry, um, to ensure that the scope includes the experience of migrants and people with insecure status um, and how that impacts health and wellbeing during the pandemic. So in short, as an update, there was a coalition of organisations which lobbied for immigration and asylum to be included in the COVID inquiry. It was successful, but we're not sure what module that will sit under. For example, there's a module on health and equality, but we're not sure that that will actually encompass the very specific nuances um, of immigration and, and the experience of people in contact with the immigration system. Um, Doctors of the World and a coalition of other organisations have made joint applications to be responders to the inquiry and we um, have been unsuccessful. Um, so that's where we're at with the COVID inquiry. Promising that immigration and asylum is there, that's promising um, that we're not sure where it will sit or, or who will be responding. And I'll leave it there because I think I've got over time. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, now, I think we're supposed to next hear from Basma, but I'm not 100% sure if the internet connection is working. So, oh, yeah. there she is. Yes. Excellent. Um, over to you. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, for inviting me to present some of my reflections based on my personal experiences and professional experiences working with refugees uh, and asylum seekers uh, uh, coming from Middle East and now also supporting refugees and asylum seekers in the UK. 
and greetings from Kent and the symbolic meaning of Kent to our discussions about the risk of vulnerability uh, and also the topic of resilience. I will, uh, I can say that the findings of the report really resonate to my experiences, at least professionally experiences working on both sides with refugees and asylum seekers, documented and undocumented, displaced population and uh, and also individuals. But I will uh, try to figure or to share some of the reflections, important reflections based on these experiences under hot titles and some of additional recommendations or also addition to the recommendations that I have read um, in the report. I will start by the hot titles and some of the reflections and then the findings or uh, some of my recommendations. First of all, uh, journeys. Um, I really like uh, to concentrate on the importance of understanding the real journeys of the people, asylum seekers and undocumented people coming and making their way to the UK. Understanding the journey means that we have to understand the health professional and the Home Office, the UK government, and everybody who is going to help to support or to interact with this population to understand the journey before deciding to come to the UK during the journey and the difficulties that these people are suffering or had suffered in order to reach to the UK and the suffering, the continuous actually suffering and difficulties that people are having uh, in the accommodation, outside the accommodation and inside the accommodation in the UK. Understanding the journeys and the needs of the people during, before, after and uh, uh, during the journey or the, the asylum, seeking asylum seeker or seeking international protection is crucial because it helps us to, uh, to uh, highlight the second point, which is culture. I do agree that the language is important uh, when we deal with asylum seekers and when we try to be uh, to increase the accessibility, but also we have to understand the culture and mainly what we do, what do we mean by culture? Understanding of the people to their culture and the experiences, the lived experiences of the people. Understanding the culture really can help us to promote and facilitate the accessibility of um, of asylum seekers and undocumented people in the UK in the accommodation. And outside the accommodation and also help us to understand what are really the barriers uh, in accessibility or in reaching or uh, on getting the proper accessibility to certain health uh, facil uh, facilities, health uh, services like primary and secondary health care and also the mental health issue. We need to understand the barriers to uh, mental health issue and disclosure as well and the issue of trust. The issue of trust is really a crucial, uh, crucial element in uh, seeking support for mental health, even in understanding and promoting knowledge, required knowledge and required skills that are mandatory for health professionals to understand and to reflect, which is a gap here in the UK. Unfortunately, not all the health professional and health care professionals uh, home office, uh, people supporting accommodation are able to understand the culture of the people who are supporting and the barriers and the stigma that these people are suffering and facing that makes them hinder or hinder their accessibility or de their disclosure to, uh, to seek support, particularly on the mental health issue and also on the uh, health, uh, general health, uh, primary and secondary. Uh, also, the third point, which I want to reflect, which is waiting and the period of waiting and the documentation. Understanding the journey and understanding <coughs> that really helps us to understand the impact, which I really would like uh, maybe in the future to understand more about the importance of waiting and uh, the barrier of waiting and the period in the lives of these people, who mainly when they are waiting documentation or, as, or status or even waiting to go outside of accommodation. So waiting concept in, this, uh, uh, in the life of these people is really very important and I hope to see more reflection or intersectionality between that concept and accessibility to health services uh, and to the documentation in general in the UK. Finally, oh, not before finally, actually, um, you mentioned like I really like in the report that you mentioned about the barriers of accessibility to services, which uh, you concluded about admin, uh, knowledge, 
uh, language and attitudes. And I would like to highlight, uh, highlight the idea of attitudes and hostile environment, actually, that it's impacting on both sides, impacting asylum seekers and displaced people to seek help, to disclose and to trust the health professionals uh, and the health facilities. Um, and also the hostile environment and the attitudes around uh, displaced uh, uh, communities in the health sector uh, and in uh, among the health professionals, which I actually hindering the proper understanding of culture and the proper understanding of counseling provision for these people, um, which really uh, may impact not only the mental health and the three different well-being that you have mentioned in the report, but actually the sustainable approach and the topic of resilience as well, which I will reflect also later on. So, and this is really important. And finally, accommodation. Uh, it's a big issue and we really need to find an alternative, sustainable, dignified, human, uh, human uh, alternative and solution to accommodation. Because as I mentioned before, understanding the journey of people and the culture of people will let us to understand why accommodation is increasing and exaggerating uh, the, tough, the difficulties and the, the mental health issue and the mental health problems among uh, asylum seekers and displaced. And if we want to fix a problem or to, to contribute a solution for a problem, actually accommodation is creating another problem which is more difficult long term, which is mental health. So understanding the journey, understanding having cultural sensitivity, among people who are supporting uh, refugees and asylum seekers and undocumented will help a lot to try to figure out what are the best way in addition to registration and providing providing counseling, what we can do in order to avoid avoid increasing the difficulties at, at every level, particularly uh, general health and mental health as well. So housing is really, uh, is really a main concern and it's con it, it, con it continue to be a main concern. Unfortunately, uh, if we are not able to understand and use the lived experiences of these people to understand what are the alternatives of accommodation and housing and collective housing and hotels. And here I come to my recommendations. First of all, I really like the recommendation and the report, but I really find it also lacking that information, yes, should be shared with these groups, but it should be shared culturally, which means we have to respect and to understand what are the best way to not only to use the native language, but to understand the ways that we are able to outreach people and we are able to make sure that the message is getting, people are understanding the message, people are getting what we, what we want them to get. So information should be respecting culture, shared culturally as well, taking into consideration unique characteristics of each population and also the unique characteristics of each individual, which is a gap now in our services with at NHS and in other sectors as well. Uh, registration for primary health care and secondary health, health care is mandatory and we should find a way also how to include the undocumented. Documentation should not be a barrier for people to seek health and should not be uh, also a contributor to, uh, to increase the difficulties in the lives of people and to, 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 to contribute to have mental health problems and issues. Train for the NHS and the UK government. Actually, the healthcare professional should be trained and synthesized and coached and monitored on cultural sensitivity. Cultural sensitivity, uh, sensitivity is critical here. And I don't mean that understanding only the language or speaking the language, no of all at all. It's important to speak the language and understand and to communicate and disseminate messages using the languages, of course. But you have to understand the culture of people, the stigma and the barriers that hinder the accessibility of people to certain kind of services. And you have to act. So healthcare professionals are lacking that kind of knowledge, technical skills, attitudes and understanding. Cultural sensitivity should be mandatory actually to all healthcare professionals and to the people who are working in accommodation and even to the home office as well. 
Assessment monitoring should, uh, to accommodation should be mandatory and should be on a regular basis and should be based on lived experiences. People who are living in the accommodation should be included in the assessment and the monitoring and the evaluation. And culture should be uh, included as well. Culture is important when we do monitoring to these. Lived experiences count and they should be included as well. Distribution and food should be also culturally, culturally um, culturally expected, like the family size, the, uh, the amount of meals, the kind of food provided, and all these culture also should be taken into consideration when we uh, try to support people by food. And we have to take, uh, to take into consideration not to create more dependency, but making people also take choices, uh, even within the accommodation. Monitoring of the, of the mental health issue and the barriers of the mental health issue should be man mandatory and monitoring of attitudes of health care professional that can increase some of the mental health problems for the asylum seekers and the displaced communities is mandatory. And the accountability here, I would like to say having a lived experience, community based, not only accountability system, but complaint mechanism for people to share their frustration and their disappointment of certain kind of attitude, the treatment and lack of understanding and not only reporting, but also seeing actions, taking actions into consideration to in order to fix or to find solutions. So people are able to build trust in the institutions because they are seeing action after reporting and after complaining. And finally, we really need to have space to reflect more in the impact on, on cult of culture, language, and status, and using the lived experience as a hot title or indicator for us to understand how we can best do the outreach, mobilize the community, uh, and train the staff and coach the staff, the healthcare staff, the, every sector that is working with the asylum seekers and displaced um, Sorry, and undocumented also in order to, for them to feel comfortable that they are able, um, they are able to report, uh, and they are able to seek uh, to seek uh, to seek support. Um, it's it's really very important to reflect. Uh, about the importance. Finally, I will finalize. I don't want to take a lot of uh, your time, but uh, the importance really of understanding uh, barriers, uh, understanding uh, stigma, understanding the journeys uh, of these people and the culture really is critical now when we speak about accessibility to human, accessibility to services, accessibility to health care, and also uh, in accommodation, it's really uh, mandatory, and we need second final recommendation. We need to include uh, include lived experiences, um, reflections, uh, in these uh, in these uh, studies or monitoring or evaluation, in order to to get better understanding how we can improve, how we can uh, advocate. <coughs> Uh, for your time and for listening to me and I am really very happy to hear any kind of questions or reflections. Thank you. Thanks very much, Basna. Uh, and our final discussant is Angelina. I will not take so much of your time. It's an afternoon. You might be falling asleep here. Um, so many thanks to uh, Nuffield uh, Foundation and the research team for the amazing uh, research work you have done. I mean, I've worked uh, in the refugee sector for the last 20 years, and I must first say that I, I am very, I feel very privileged and humbled to work with this particular client group. Every time I speak about them, I, I, I get emotional because I, I'm in the front line. I have as I speak to them, I see various faces in front of me. I've, yeah, I've had uh, narratives in front of me uh, as, you know, the first hand, you know, kind of uh, story. So, yeah, so, so please bear with me. Uh, I was looking at, at your strap line and I was thinking, you know, it is such a powerful strap line, the power of evidence to change lives. And I think research is, is, is great work uh, that informs our uh, systems change. Uh, so that we can improve on the other work we do. So um, uh, I'm quite uh, delighted to come and speak from practice from the front line and also uh, acknowledge 
really the, uh, the valuable work uh, and the fact that this report do uh, represent the clients we work with. Um, and so I thought what, uh, what I'll do is um, uh, also looking at your, uh, your report uh, on to why I feel asylum seekers and refugees fall under the risk of vulnerability and the factors associated with well-being and so hence fitting uh, in this report. Uh, I'll also look at some challenges that what we experience on the ground, uh, frontline reported by the various therapists that I work with, uh, and also look at uh, posts of uh, various good practice that we have identified uh, across the sector. So, where do I go now? Right. Uh, I must say that uh, uh, the refugee phenomenon is, is a story of forced dislocation and a story of adversity, uh, loss, uh, obviously uh, abuse of human rights, but it's also a story of inspiration uh, uh, a story of resilience and compassion, uh, a story of hope. Uh, Professor Papadopoulos did uh, categorize the refugee experience into four uh, different stages there and dissipation, uh, uh, adversity. And so it's good to remember that nobody was born a refugee. Yeah, a refugee, uh, it, it happens. Uh, we are all bearing witness to what's happening in Ukraine, right in front, unfolding in front of us. And so people were living uh, their life correctly. And then obviously something happened, whether it's invasion, as it was happening now, or, or, or there is a war in their country. And so it takes time for people to leave their country. And so for me, that is the beginning of the refugee phenomenon. The refugee trauma starts from there. It doesn't start from when we see them in this country. We start from that stage of you know, uh, negotiating. You know, are we safe? Are we not safe? What are, what are we going to take? Who am I going to save? How am I gonna do, what am I going to do with my sick mother? What am I going to do with my uncle, my auntie? You know, and, my, and, and the familiar ground. So it's that kind of, the kind of hyper arousal, if you like, that starts from there. It doesn't start from when we see the clients from, from this country. And I, I'm bringing that so that sometimes we might miss out on the bigger picture when we work with the clients in front of us and we think they're here now, I'm going to work with that. No, that story has started many, many years and sometimes many months or years before the anticipation stage where thinking that things are still going to work and then adversity kicks in and you actually realize that actually it's a question of life of death and I must live what I can live and, and, and free. And so as we all know that there's no refugee uh, passport, so to say, we haven't seen people coming from Ukraine with the suitcases and, the, and their bags and anything. They just take the little what they have and they free the country. So again, uh, just understanding that the challenge that uh, the, whole, uh, the whole phenomena, the whole experience brings uh, with being a, 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 a refugee. So, and so, you know, I'm not going to go into details with this because we know the journey is, is really dangerous. The horrific stories we hear on front line uh, in North Africa, we've seen people, we've had or we've had clients telling us how they were captured there. They were taken into factories for forced labor uh, in two years before they flee. We've had of people being uh, stolen their organs. We, you know, we've had two clients uh, at least who've uh, come here with one kidney because they were drugged and, you know, and so... I don't want to go into that, I, but I still I can see a face of a woman who uh, she, she fled Pakistan and along the journey, obviously it takes, because you have to cross countries and, and you have no right to cross countries and there's no law protecting you. And she fled with her 14 year old daughter, she was trying to protect her. But when the, um, uh, the human smugglers came and you know, you have to wait for your time to get into those lorries. And obviously uh, you have to wait and there are many people waiting and when the lorry comes, you can only take two or three and she was put in a lorry and they shut the lorry and they left the daughter behind and she, left, she arrived here with no daughter. So you can imagine that woman trying to support that woman. She had cried her tears off and even the voice uh, of crying was at a distance. So it still rings us in my mind. So it's the, 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 the journey is dangerous. And so um, clients are forced why we, we can group people as refugees, I also like to, to say that every story is unique and that no story is like the other one. So it's very important that you know people are exposed to different types of abuse and every abuse is, it challenges their core value and obviously reframes their self-identity. And it's really important that we, do, we deal with people in their unique stories, in their uniqueness, depending on what experiences they may have experienced and the interpretation of those experiences which differs from people. Some, uh, different people. So it's not easy to say that because somebody has gone through domestic violence, the impact on that person depends on that particular person in how they interpret it. The asylum system here is very complex. So once you arrive in this country, and it takes months maybe to arrive and navigate in everything that I've said before. Once you arrive here, it's another nightmare. So you think that, oh, you know, I've arrived, the, the 
country of milk and honey is here. I'm okay now, but we clearly know that's not correct. There's system challenges there, there's social challenges, the political discourse, everything here is really, really, you know, clients are trapped in hotels for months and months. Uh, obviously, uh, they're not allowed to work if you're an asylum seeker. Uh, there's an improvement now, you get eight pounds a week before you will not get even that. So yeah, it's really difficult. It's it's more complicated even to practitioners even to understand the systems these people live in. So you can imagine what that means to uh, asylum seekers. So, I think goes. Oh, it's not moving. Sorry. Yeah. Now, I just want to acknowledge the barriers that uh, or the challenges that were identified in, the, in this report because they are very spot on. These challenges is what we see on the ground. You know, the asylum application, as I said, is really complicated lack of legal uh, representations. Health access is a nightmare, as the, this report have clearly stated. Some GPs still will say no, even though they are not, they are not uh, legally, they should not be saying no. Yeah, the food, the housing, you know, the list is, is, is long. I shall not go into it, but it's really, really uh, complex. So that compounded to the experiences, compounded to what's happening there in, 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 in their country. You can imagine the kind of uh, uh, the multidimensional uh, issues that are going on to that person and how that changes your your really your 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 whole being, and hence, uh, how do we then respond to these issues? There is a, a a risk in dissecting a client so that you're only responding to the housing issue and you're not taking into account what else is going on. It's really important that practitioners we try and improve our services to understand that even though I'm a doctor, what's happened to your housing situation? What's happened to your social uh, situation? What's happened to your, you know, your mental health situation? And how can organizations speak to each other? And until we reach that point as, as, as a system, I'm afraid that we are still struggling in how we can give that holistic response to these people in, in a way that they can really work well. And so um, how, having organizations to speak to each other, for me, is the key. Uh, identifying what other organizations can support this person. So how can we work together and work in a multi-agency? approach. How can we build that scaffolding that's needed? Because just one, you know, we know what that one still cannot hold a building. We need to bring them all together and build a kind of a scaffolding that clients can stand on and so that they can access the service they need to kind of rebuild their life. So it's really important that to understand that even if you're a teacher, to really take time to listen to the client, not just to the uh, uh, teaching needs, but also what else is going on to their life if you're going to have meaning, meaningful uh, interventions for that person. And for me, that is the key that works um, for this particular client group. Uh, so just briefly, I just want to say this, uh, yeah, short, a small research we collaborated with the uh, uh, City of University that kind of really helped uh, to, uh, to kind of develop some uh, kind of tools to help uh, this particular client group, you know, a guide on how to use a GP. Because if you go to a new country, you don't know, you don't know the system, you don't know the how it's going on. And so, psychoeducation is really important. Educating people, giving them information, us not working as experts, but really in a collaboration, a cooperation way. So we are engaging with them rather than us being here, then being the clever ones. But we are really welcoming them. We are the hosts. They are the, our guests. How can we welcome them and tell them how things are done here? How can we uh, inform them of our culture? rather than punishing them, rather, you know, if, if things are done differently here from their country. But unless we tell them how things are done differently here, they might not know, but we might be very rash and hasty to judge them, while actually we have not created that space to actually enlighten them and give them that information, signposting, and, and really creating tools that can help. So, yeah, so these tools are on our website, which really kind of help. But again, uh, what this research has done is really amplify amplify the information that's needed and that hoping that more people can read this report and really review how we are working to respond to the service uh, 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 effectively. And so, yeah, so that's all. I've run out of time. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to suggest that we don't break the coffee and we just go straight into uh, the Q&A, uh, given timing, uh, which is my fault entirely, is an appalling chair. Um, so uh, could the discussants and the presenters go over here? And I think we'll just take questions from both the audience in sorry, person. Sorry, we do actually need a break because we need to do a couple of technical things. Oh, so, we sorry. do need a break, Carmen. Sorry. <laughs> so should we do, can we do five minutes? I can't need ten, I'm afraid. I am sorry. So.
Okay, then. Uh, we can have discussions potentially if you have questions during the break and then we can carry on in a big group, especially for those who need to leave. Let's kick on because uh, we, we, we are limited in time. Um, I'm sure she'll be back. Oh, she is. Um, okay, so we now move on to the question and answer session. So this is opportunity for people both in the room and online to ask any questions they have, both factual questions, I guess, primarily probably to Laurence to answer, and then any observations they have. I'm going to desperately beg everyone to keep their questions short and concise, uh, given that we are running over and we'll probably run over a little bit after um, um, 3.30. Okay, so um, let's kick off. Uh, anyone who has any questions, either in the audience or online? Ah, at the back. Then. Hi. Um, my question was about the migrants, not whether in the UK, but I've, I've been asking myself what what are the circumstances or the factors that brought these migrants to this country in the first place? Now, an easy answer would be persecution or something. But when I looked into it deeper and I was looking at the connections between climate change and migration, but specifically forced migration, um, I found a connection between um, those countries which are rich in resources, extractive resources, where there's forced um, mining activities, and then those people who are the citizens of that land become forced migrants having to leave their land or their country. They look at the UK or the USA for some example, and then they come here. So I was seeing the flowchart at the end, which is talking about well-being of the individual. So my question is, is the well-being of the individual is considered when they're the migrants here. But to prevent this problem happening, i.e. migrants wanting to come to the UK because I think most of them want to stay in their own country as well. What about the well-being of those migrants when they are still in their own country? persecuted by those activities I mentioned. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I've been nominated. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, that's, uh, I would say that's a heavy loaded question. Um, I think, um, yeah, it, it's quite heavy because you, you're asking me on why people leave their country in the first place and why um, maybe um, interventions cannot be set within their own country so that we stop the flow. And my answer to that, I think it's above me, really, uh, unless I get into the political discourse, which uh, I think I might um, uh, fall short of ex explaining um, but what I know is that I think as a human humanity, we can do all our part within our means. Uh, uh, I, that little bit we can do as individuals with your capacity and resources. And that for me, it's really responding to those who arrive here and understanding uh, what is being presented and responding. Uh, obviously, I'm hoping that the war in Ukraine will stop, but I think... Uh, well, I don't know what I can say about that, apart from hope that uh, the, the powerful actors are doing what they can do. Uh, obviously, it's very sad. Uh, it's sad to see Syria go down. It's sad to see the invasion, uh, the, 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 the invasion by Taliban in Afghanistan, which is ongoing. Uh, it's sad to see Ukraine. Uh, it's horrible in Somalia. So yeah, um, I think that's quite a, a huge uh, question. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks. I mean, I think kind of one observation I would perhaps make is that uh, this is a, a question that you ask is going to get more and more important. Um, so particularly with climate change, I think the question of those flows will will potentially become enormous in the next 10 to 20 years. And I think policymakers probably aren't actually focused very clearly on that issue. And, and just to add, I think that's also something that Basma mentioned as well in her intervention in terms of like taking into account the kind of lived experiences um, not only kind of at, at destination to use that um, 
that kind of terminology, but also kind of at origin as well. Um, I don't know if Basma is still around. I'd like to comment very quickly. This is a very valid and fair question. And actually, you, uh, me, I am not in a position to answer, but if you are interested, you all, you go directly and ask people why they are leaving. And we have, we, we should not forget that we do have freedom of movement and it become inevitable. People keep moving around the countries seeking or for whatever reason, migration and moving is part of a human nature, human history. We will, but it's more working in ourselves how we really help people keep moving, but keep moving in a dignified and a human, a human way. You get my point, but it's a very valid, fair question. Keep asking it, keep asking it for the relevant people to learn, to understand and to reflect. Thank you so much. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yes, at the back there. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Angelina, your mention of the Ukrainian war just now made me wonder, I suppose, the, the timing of the research um, made this impossible, but um, whether you gathered any incidental data or have any thoughts about um, how the pathways that people might have taken or legal pathways that existed to come into the country impacted on well-being. So obviously uh, a pathway was created for Ukrainians that hadn't existed for any other um, nationality group. There are, I suppose, similar pathways like uh, the vulnerable um, program for vulnerable Sy Syrians, whether the impact um, on, on well-being was something that you observed um, on the basis of different nationality groups. Uh, thank you. I think this is still unfolding for us. It's uh, the Ukraine um, forced dislocation or uh, they move into exile. Even the practitioners, we are all asking ourselves questions when we step in, when is the right time to go and offer them therapy. Uh, clearly, uh, the good thing is that the government is responding to this uh, particular client group with the, uh, the different support packages. They are not coming in as asylum seekers. They have a support package ready. Uh, which for me, I think it's good. Uh, however, it's like living in real time movie because the war is still very much ongoing. And so most of the clients we see are completely preoccupied with what's going on in their country. They are not here and they're not there. They are just somewhere there in limbo. And we've seen many of them come and go back to their country, hoping that things are going to uh, develop. And so the issue of the impact, I think data can only be collected after some time, but it's like it's right now, it's unfolding, it's building, and we don't know the impact of it. Some people have not kind of comprehended to actually even uh, understand the, the, the trauma they are going through. Uh, so it's, it's, it's real time, and it, it's quite difficult right now to gather data, if that's okay. okay. Um, thank you for your question. I, I think what you're sort of honing in on is like parity, perhaps, between arrivals on pre, a pre-agreed scheme and people utilising their legal right to claim asylum and the differing support that's available to differing groups. Um, the routes that have been put in place, for example, following the evacuation of Afghanistan, um, the homes for Ukraine. This is right and proper, and we should see more of this. Um, and, but, in terms of the other massive political discourse, which is you know the Nationality and Borders Bill, which is criminalising legal routes um, for asylum claimants, um, it is a very interesting. You know, for example, in the context of healthcare, I don't have an answer to your question with regards to how is this playing out wellbeing wise. But in answer to your question, um, the NHS charging regulations, which this piece of research discusses um, people, um, Ukrainian arrivals are exempt from NHS charging. So that, that's quite a, a clear message there around, well, if the government doesn't acknowledge that there's an inherent harm in the regulations, then why does it feel the need to exempt a group? Um, and and I'm to be clear, I'm obviously very happy that that, that exemption was put in place, but it speaks volumes about um, acknowledgement of what the regulations mean for other people who are affected. Um, if we think about the evacuation of Afghanistan, people that came um, through the um, APRS and the A, 
C, I can't remember the rest of the acronym, the scheme, they still are accommodated in hotels. You know, there is still a, a and a, the, a, a, it's by no means easy for um, that group of individuals. Just arriving on a pre-agreed scheme doesn't mean that your experience when you arrive is, is smooth. It doesn't mean that you're connected to the healthcare services that you're entitled to. But what it might mean is that um, your legitimacy um, might, you might face fewer questions. Like when I was on succumbent at the GLA, I didn't hear many instances of people, um, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but I didn't hear of registration refusal, for instance, for or denial, sorry, I didn't hear of denial of secondary care and the exemption conversation for someone um, who'd arrived via one of those schemes. So I think it is a, a relevant question. I think the places, um, the schemes that we've put in place are good. I think we can build on them. I think they should be better. And I think we should consider migration in, in, in as a whole. Um, but yeah, as Angelina says, it's emerging. And, and just very quickly, I think uh, what Jenny was saying at the end of our presentation in terms of there's a lot of the data that's been untapped and what we have, uh, unfortunately, we don't have data, especially in terms of nationality or, or the numbers for um, kind of closer years to 2020, but for the 2011 to 2018, that's definitely something that we could also try to look into in terms of the nationality, because in some instances, we do have that information, but it does also require a lot of work in terms of making sure that we have the kind of right numbers to be able to, to, to say something relevant about it. Uh, thank you. Um, I realise that I'm not getting any questions online. I don't know whether there are any questions online because we can't see them. Jenny, are there any questions online? Yes, so we've had quite a few questions from online. So um, one question that we've received is, what were one, some of the surprises or outliers from the consultation notes and interviews that give new insight into asylum seekers' experiences? Okay, um, well, I think I can't, because from the qualitative data, um, I, I think um, not everybody was an asylum seeker, and so asylum seekers are actually a fairly uh, uh, a small percentage of, of the whole group. So I, I'm just kind of struggling to think whether I think of something particularly to the um, uh, asylum seekers, kind of the whole cohort, I think what really surprised me and I think what also came out of a bit of what I, what I said earlier was the way in which people seemed to be working with you know the smallest of resources and linking with other people and kind of managing to kind of survive and keep you know body and soul together and uh, that that kind of was really kind of quite surprising and quite humbling I think for somebody like me so I think I obviously you shouldn't go kind of, oh, these people are happy, you don't have to help them because that would be silly, wouldn't it? But uh, that the way that people were really resourceful, I think that did strike me. Uh, also, I think from some of the discussions that we had, especially around GP registration, mm -hmm. I think from the notes, and that's something that will sound familiar to doctors of the world, which is sometimes just the sheer pro, the sheer length of the process of trying to get someone registered with a GP yeah. and <laughs> the kind of barriers and the time and the effort, even from doctors of the world volunteers trying to register someone. So someone who knows about the system having such a such in some certain instances, so many problems trying to register someone and the kind of like administrative hurdles that are present, that kind of almost everyday bordering as well that is happening. Um, that's also something I think we've all, we, I th I, well, at least for me, was kind of hmm. um, not thinking that it would happen easily, but sometimes even for those who know how, how, how kind of challenging it could be. Sorry, I just feel like you share one of the stories I had of a client I was working with from Sudan, um, uh, Dafur or somewhere else, where they were very tough and they are brought up to be very strong and, and were not... Um, um, they didn't believe in crying or showing emotions and he had been tortured and he would not accept in therapy to say he had been tortured. He would not acknowledge his uh, torturers and he had a really deep philosophical kind of insight of his own life. And he was a really challenge to me to work in therapy. And so I kind of I, like, you know, I, I had nothing for him really. And uh, when I enrolled to do my master's in refugee care, I recommended him to the professor and he was uh, he, he went for an interview and he ended up in the same class with me. So we did the Masters of Refugee Care together. So I just showing how, how resourceful and how powerful they can be. He 
he was a living story of his own experience. Excellent, thank you. Great, sir. Um, since I've had two questions from on, uh, in person and only one from online, I'll do one more online question if there is one. Sorry, I was just reading a comment by um, Jenny, who's written, as someone who spent the last four years reading survivors' experience of SGBV, I was actually not prepared for the cruelty that some of the asylum seekers in ICA experienced. Hotels refusing to refrigerate life-preserving medication and the amount of desperation and associated suicidality and self-harm. Um, and then, so we had another question online from Niloha Ranjal, which is refugees need to be taught how to raise a concern after they face discrimination and be knowledgeable about who is going to deal with these issues. Who can answer this question? Who defends refugees? <laughs> we try. We have our case workers. We do advocacy for them. I have a case I've taken to the ombudsman, which is really challenging. It's taken me like almost two years just to challenge uh, the legal representative who did not respond to this client for months and months, and the client was homeless, and they would not even reply to her calls or to emails. Uh, so I thought that was unfair treatment. We do the bit that we can do, but it's just a drop in the ocean. If I may, Jennifer, I leave. Yeah, yeah, carry on. I do agree that refugees should be a trained coach and not trouble about how they are reporting and the signs of discrimination. And this is how our, this is also corresponds to my uh, point of understanding the culture, not only the culture, understanding the culture from the side of the UK healthcare professional or, uh, or home office or the UK government, but also understanding the culture in the UK and how we report concerns. So. It should be actually, it should be mandatory and it should be cult culturally sensitive and language sensitive as well. But I do agree. Who defend refugees? Everybody. Refugees themselves. Everybody can have a role, not only in defending, advocating, lobbying, uh, raising awareness, speaking, but refugees themselves should, should be at the, at the initial stage, should be able to defend themselves and their rights. Thank you so much. I really have to run because I have another meeting. It was a really pleasure to have all of you and to invite me to give my contributions to the report and we hope we keep uh, we keep on the discussion thank you so much thanks very much Pastor. Uh, any questions um thank you i'm sally daglian from praxis and we work with migrants in um crisis many of whom are undocumented i think the report's brilliant and um great to see all the recommendations I, I suppose I have a question around the breadth of the, the recommendations as far as I can see them, given that such a substantial number of um, the people interviewed were undocumented rather than asylum seekers. And I think there are lots of issues there around um, the, the causes of undocumentation. The reach, research by JCWI, I think, showed that I'm like 76 percent of people that they surveyed who were undocumented all started with a legal status. Um, we have legal services and we find many, many people actually pushed into a status of undocumentation by the Home Office itself, by the systems that force people to apply for new visas every two and a half years at really expensive uh, cost that it takes on average 11 months for the Home Office to make a decision. So I think all of these things really impact on people's well-being because they push them out of employment, they push them into destitution and homelessness. Um, and I just wondered whether um, Nuffield or in terms of the, the report, having just you know seen the this, this summary, what linking there is to those wider issues um, and to campaigns and to um, recommendations that other people are making around improving home office uh, processes, uh, about changing people's entitlement so that they're not 
pushed into a situation where they have no access to any kind of welfare safety net. So I think the, the question or comment is just about having a, a joined up uh, or a sort of broader approach um, to add to these really excellent recommendations that focus mainly on asylum. I would be more than happy to have those conversations with you. I think the team absolutely and um, Dr. Zadawala probably yeah. as well. I mean, I assume you work together. Um, uh, but yeah, absolutely. So we've not really thought, we've not really recommended anything about the kind of, the, kind of the, the process in and of itself, but definitely there are some, you know, there are some 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 issues, there are some links and some linkages, and inter especially in terms of the kind of, that kind of loss of entitlement and, and, and that kind of like moving into undocumentation or kind of quote unquote illegality within kind of the, these kind of processes. It's not something that we've kind of focused on in the project itself, but I think Antje maybe from, from, from some of the, the work. Yeah. From the qualitative end, yes. I, I, I can't now link kind of directly to the kind of really broad recommendation, but actually the qualitative data tells us a little bit of what happens if somebody comes documented and then becomes undocumented. So quite a few people actually had the documents taken of them, often by people that actually helped them to come to the UK, like kind of labor agency type kind of, or fake labor agencies, whatever. And um, then there were uh, people who came with an employer and the employer kind of forgot to renew the visa or accidentally on purpose forgot to renew the visa and uh, then uh, relationships breaking down. And uh, so there actually is, I mean, it's not massive amounts of data, but there is a little bit about, um, kind of things about kind of how documents kind of are lost, expire, um, and um, you know making sure that people kind of reconnect with these um, systems and if it's being made easier for them to reconnect will be really important. Um, thanks, can you hear me? Um, I would yes, yeah, say yes. The joined up approach, absolutely, and yeah. Um, I think in terms of the COVID inquiry recommendation is a good example of that. So there's a lobby to include um, immigration, people in contact with the immigration system as a as a consideration within the inquiry. And then that's accepted, but we see a health inequalities module. So that excludes, um, which is we're glad to see health inequalities. We very much hope that um, immigration and asylum will be included there or people who've been in contact with the immigration process or people who are undocumented. But then that's not going to be good enough as a whole for, the, for that. That's, that doesn't... That doesn't saturate the needs that need to be reflected for this population in the inquiry that negates workforce, um, gig economy work, things like that, that not necessarily under health inequalities, but we've no doubt that there is a loop background to poor health, as the report has shown. Um, so the answer is yes, you know, we, we've, we've got a health focus in terms of this report. We're looking at bodies that have got levers of power to make changes, such as at the primary care reception desk, um, such as within the NHS charging regulations. But Yes, it's this is political. Um, this is a political um, move in terms of systematic exclusion, and it should be considered as a whole. So I agree, and I think re recommendations should be, you know, future recommendations embedded in that. You know, that's the baseline from which we're all working. Yeah. Okay. Great. I mean, I just um, one of the things you mentioned that the Migration Advisory Committee have been um, pushing the government on is the question of fees. So we've made the point that, um, in particular, the fees that are associated with indefinite leave to remain are, <laughs> let's let's be honest, absolutely outrageous. Um, and I think there needs to be a fundamental review of both what fees are charged for what purpose, and actually to try and get away from the, this ridiculous situation that currently exists, which is essentially we use fees to subsidise the entire operation of the immigration system. So we have this rather odd situation where you know, a social care worker comes to Britain and to get indefinite leave to remain has to pay £2,600 per person. And the reason we charge that much is because we want to fund the asylum system. And why those two things are related seems to be a bit of a mystery to the committee. So we, we're pushing the government very strongly on thinking about making fees actually reflect the cost of the service rather than as they are for British citizens by and large. So, um, OK, um, I think we're pretty much out of time. So um, I'm going to suggest that um, we, um, first of all, thank, um, well, so I'm going to give Lawrence the final word since um, um, it's uh, she's the PI. Um, so, but um, before I give her thanks, just uh, to thank all, all of the discussants who have joined us today and the rest of her, uh, Lawrence's team uh, for the um, for the talk today. And of course, everyone both online and in person who's come to um, 
to listen to this uh, really interesting and kind of thought-provoking uh, piece of work. So um, thanks to everyone. And I'm going to give Lawrence just a final, final big takeaway that we should be thinking about as we leave today. Uh, no pressure at all. <laughs> all I'll say is thank you very much for coming, for being here, for asking questions and making some comments and food for thought as well. And if you have more questions, more comments, uh, send them our way. We'll gladly uh, be having those conversations with you because it's not an it's not an issue that's happening in a vacuum. That's uh, you know, and it's something that's ever evolving. And we'd be more than happy to to discuss um, recommendations and suggestions for future research. Um, exp um, kind of tapping into more of the data uh, or other things would be uh, gladly, we'll gladly have those conversations. So please do keep in touch. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.